All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so I just added this because we started talking about it during Kent's thing, um, and I figured it deserved a uh, wider audience because I have to re-explain this problem like every couple of years when somebody discovers it. Uh, so what happens with ButterFS um, is we have this concept called subvolumes. The subvolume has its own unique inode space. The subvolume is what we can take a snapshot of. So a common use case is you have a subvolume for your home directory, so you can snapshot your home directories. You have a subvolume for like the root file system, so you can snapshot the root file system. In Facebook, we have um, subvolumes for the container images. So you can snapshot a container image and start a container right away from a clean image. So the problem here is that when you snapshot it, it's literally just a metadata block that points to an existing block and adds reference counts. So the, you have the same files, the same data, and the same inode numbers. So you stat, you know, if I have a picture, you know, a picture in my home directory and my snapshot, and I stat both of those files, I get the same inode number for both of these files. This confuses applications. rsync is the main one that we were concerned with at the time. Chris came up with this relatively simple solution, which was um, the way uh, rsync or find or anybody else uses to determine whether or not they've wandered into a different file system is you change stdev in the stat. So we have anonymous, an anonymous block device that we allocate for every subvolume, and when you stat a file, we give you that anonymous device's stdev for that file. This is a really easy way to solve this problem because now rsync goes, okay, these two files, although they have the same inodes, they're different because they're on a different file system. When in reality, they're on the same file system. Now, the, uh, uh, Slav is asking if there's slides. There's no slides because I wasn't planning on talking about this here because it makes me very angry. Um, every time this comes up, people yell and complain about how terribly broken it is. Sure, it's not it's not a great solution because there's no there's no file system that does this. There's no file system that like has the same inodes like inode numbers, but like a unique inode space per subvolume. What you like because in reality, what you have is you have a subvolume ID and an inode number. And this is how we export things over NFS. The NFS file handle thing, the unique ID, is the, sub the object ID of the root that, it, that the inode belongs to and the inode number. And this combination is, in fact, unique. So when you do the file handle thing, and ButterFS has its own file handle, like every file system does, you get the object ID and the inode number. This works really, really well. Um, Ceph, Ceph does this as well. Same inode number, same FS. Cool. Um, so anyway, the, this comes up every few years when somebody discovers it and thinks it's super broken and then like tells me all the ways that it's easy to fix and then realizes quickly after a lot of emails that it's not actually that easy to fix. The most recent one was Oh, I, I keep blanking on his name. He maintained, yeah, Neil Brown. Neil Brown discovered this. This is a particularly problematic for NFS because NFS, if you export a, you export the file system, the directory that contains the subvolume and its snapshots, then you can have the same inode numbers for a, di a bunch of different files, um, but NFS on the client loses the fact that these are on different um, subvolumes, and so it can't change the stdev on, the, res on the, the client because it doesn't know it. By the time that it gets over to the client, the client has lost all knowledge that this is a ButterFS-backed file system. And so there's a lot of, like a lot of things that he tried to do in order to fix this. Um, and eventually, what what I want to do, um, and this is like Bruce said, this would probably work for for NFSD, 
is that instead of you know doing all the weird things, which he was like XORing random bytes, and then he was XORing the object ID of the root into the inode number, and this like ends up really terrible because you can still end up with um, the the same number. Uh, is I want to extend StatX to tell you the subvolume, like essentially the subvolume ID, so that you can say statafile, because this is the other problem that you have with this is that if you statafile, you get a different dev t, a st dev, and you don't actually know if this st dev is on the same file system as another file and another snapshot. And so this kind of is problematic in a different way if you want to know if these two things exist on the same file system. So I want to extend StatX to say, to include two pieces of information. One is a UUID for the file system, saying I, my, this inode belongs to this FSID. We have the concept of FSIDs everywhere. We have it in block ID. We have it in all of these places. I want to extend StatX to have, encode the FSID of the containing file system. This way we can easily tell if two files are on a different subvolume, that they're a part of the same file system. This is for user space. And then what I want to do is add another field to, um, to StatX. And so this is where it's a little bit, we can do one of two things. We can add a U64 to include the object ID of the root. So this is unique. And so like then NFS can say like, okay, I know that these things are unique and then they can do whatever it wants to do to know that these two, that these two objects are unique. Uh, alternatively, ButterFS has UUIDs for all the subvolumes. So if we wanted to say, keeping in the theme of having UUIDs, we have StatX have two new UUID fields. One is the FSID for the, 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 overlap, the file system as a whole. And then secondly is the subvolume UUID which is, again, still unique to ButterFS. And then again, NFS can do what, because then NFS has all the information it needs to have about like whether or not this object is unique or not. So that's what I want to do. Uh, question, in what way is that different from uh, snapshotting um, ext4 on uh, LVTIN, right? You, you still get uh, snapshots of the file system, different log devices that are dynamically allocated. In what way is it different? In what way is the use case? Is the user story different? So I, I think it's that you still have the same problems with the XD4 snapshots, right? Because. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, like as, far as, like as far as I understand it, we have this problem Anybody that has the snapshotting is going to have this problem. The only people that like that do snapshotting that don't have this problem is like LVM or anybody that does it at the block layer level, right? Because then it's a completely separate block device. But for file system based snapshotting, like we're all going to have this problem. Sorry, Leighton is saying something. Yeah, so. Leighton is saying that this means formalizing the concept of file system and subvolume, and that may be a good thing, but we need to consider other FSs might not fit neatly into those concepts. So that's what I'm kind of wondering is like, I know all of the local file systems that I pay attention to have FSIDs, right? Like ext4 has that, XFS I'm sure has it. I don't know about any. So who? Oh, does FAT? I don't think fat does it, but who gives a shit about that? Yeah. So uh, Howells is saying that does, asking if fat does it. So like I guess that's a good point because like EFI just USB stick plug in and it's not going to have a UUID to spit out. Does that matter for that case though? Like you just simply don't have a value for that. I don't think that's okay, right? Like, right. You are asking about UUID, right? Not FSID. Well, like FSID, UUID, like I'm using them interchangeably, but like FSID is like the UUID for the entire file system, and then like, the, because there's a different FSID that sometimes 
Okay. That's what time. Yeah, I think uh, some of the FAT file systems actually do have a 32 and maybe 64 bit FSID. It's just not a UUID like thing. Right. Um, and so that has come up when people have proposed uh, generic file system uh, APIs for setting the UUID on a file system if you want to change it because not all file systems have UUIDs that are a standard 128-bit UUID. Um, I think one of the bigger questions, though, is when you say that two files are in the same file system, but they're in different sub-volumes, kind of begs the question of what does in the same file system mean, right? One definition is you're allowed to move the file, you know, using rename um, between two, two different directories um, in the same file system, or you are allowed to create hard links um, between two, you know, directories that are in the same file system. And I'm not sure, uh, does ButterFS subvolumes allow you to do that? So ButterFS subvolumes, you can't rename and you can't hard link. You can ref link. Okay. So. Yeah, because I think that that's one of the things we will want to be very clear when we say, what does it even mean that two directories are in the same file system? Because some people might think that that means you can MV between them or hard link between them. Right. Uh, and I think you have a different definition of what it means for they're in the same file system. Uh, and I'm not sure you've clearly articulated your definition of, you know, from, from a user space application, why would they care that they are in the same file system, right? One reason is they want to do hard links. Right. Um, there may be others. So, so for, for my use case, the like, I need to know if these two files are the same file system is mostly just from like a maintenance, tra like a maintenance thing, like, oh, this file is in this file system and this file is in this file system. And so I need to, unmount this specific file system, and once I do that, then I'm good or whatever. Like different maintenance tasks where I can go, okay, these are in the same file system, and this is the file system that I'm looking for. Now, what got me super excited about the reflink example, I mean, whether we allow hard links someday, whatever, that seems less important, but the thing that just jumped out at me, right, is that although I'm working on Linux, the kernel, you know, I'm in Azure, right? And the idea that you could have two exports and suddenly with this change, you know, a few, a few weeks ago, right, we can now do a ref link in theory. Yeah. Now, that doesn't help with everybody, right, because at the moment we don't allow that in the server, but it sort of like jumped out at me that, oh, I guess we should. We should ask our server guys to allow that. Yeah. You already support uh, copy range between different yeah, file yeah. systems yeah. and that's enough. Yeah. for ButterFS to implement reflink, you don't yeah. need to support the clone operation. Copy, yeah. copy range will do it. Right. Yeah, and, and I think it was maybe Christoph had an objection because we had already supported, like you said, we had already supported the copy chunk. And um, I don't remember who it was, but a number of years ago, we had an objection from somebody. So we chose the strictest form, which was the clone, basically, where CP, like when you do a CP, instead of using what Windows uses, or what a Mac would use to do CP, which is offloading the copy to the server, it would require doing a ref link. Well, that works now. For example, if I mount to Samba with the change that went in a few weeks ago, copy is instant because CP does a ref link. Right, but uh, all the uh, implemented uh, copy file range across uh, uh, mounts for NFS, and that, that should work for ButterFS and for SIX as well. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'm, I, was, I, I found it really exciting, the, the, the whole thing. But the, your point is valid, though, about, about how do you find out the FSID. I looked at the EXFAT code just a second ago, and it looks like they manufacture the, uh, the FSID from the block device. Right. So it's a nice hack, and it's probably good enough, right? Yeah, I, like, I, so this is... This is mostly just to give the user more information, right? So it doesn't have to be perfect. It's yeah. first, first and foremost, it is give the user more and more perfect information. Because right now, like, 
I can stat a file and I can't tell where it's mounted because it gives me the anonymous BDEV, it doesn't give me the BDEV of the actual mounted file system. So that's, that's a problem, right? So if I have the FS ID, I just look up the FS ID and I know where I'm mounted. Um, and then the other, the second big thing is exporting, <laughs> exporting things across NFS or SIFS or whatever and mm -hmm. suddenly you get the same item numbers that, for, that are for different files. Yeah. And giving the cert, like the NFS guys more information of, you know, this is an FS, like a different FS ID or different sub volume or whatever, then it lets them do what they need to do in order to make the things unique. Yeah, I, I remember it came up with some something on the uh, KSMB, the kernel SMB server thread. Um, the whole issue of FS, it, it was maybe something on the email thread a few months ago about this. Um, and I think they, they properly advertise it now, but at the same time, I don't think it's as important as the NFS example, yeah. because you know these are you know if you're exporting two shares that happen to be the same thing underneath. I mean, the, that's the thing. It's like it it's not a big deal. it only confuses find for you know rsync yeah. or whatever. Like NFS handles it fine. Like you, because again, it's using the file handle and the file handle, like is resolved to the unique object. It's purely like user space trips over this thing and doesn't know what to do. And NFS has the ability in the protocol to tag this extra information so that it can then, on the client, represent, okay, these are two separate file systems. Don't, like they're gonna be, like they could have overlapping item numbers, don't treat them as the same thing. And so like I need to have a way, uh, a standard way to let NFS be able to do what NFS does. I don't care what they do. So I just need to have a way for them to know how to do it and a way to tell user space, hey, look, this file belongs to this file system. And it, so you can then do all of the like, find where my file system is and what disk it is, magic. And also a better way to like articulate that this is on a different sub volume from another, another uh, file. So I was wondering why uh, LVM uh, cloning, whatever you call it, uh, doesn't have this problem because doesn't that just copy the, effectively copy the entire block device so you get the FSIE copied as well? Yeah, but you get the um, a different block device. So like it, so right. when you mount the snapshot or whatever, you get unique. I, it's the same yeah. thing that what ButterFS does now. You get a different yeah. ST dev. Oh, so and will that be persistent across reboots? Yeah, it'll be persistent because it uses the actual ST dev of the actual device, whereas we're using an anonymous one that's just random. I do, I do think I was wondering is is statics the right place to put this, or do you want an extended statfs effectively, and then we can add several UID UUIDs or FS info or whatever comes with, is chosen for that. Because then you have a UUID for your snapshot, a UUID for your base, your complete file system thing, and a UUID for devices on. Yeah, so like I, I think that some of this stuff, like like the global FSID thing, yeah. can be in a statfs or whatever. It's just it's just that you possibly don't want to cart this out every time someone does a stat system call. Right, but the I do need a way to tell stats like this is the file system that i'm on right because like or you need to be able to say like this file belongs to this file do that right. mapping back and like that stat is the only interface for that right at the moment yeah. Statics, yeah um i'm i'm just still a little confused about the fsid it seems the main issue will be the main argument that will be leveraged against this is it needs to be something that makes sense for all file systems. And even for ButterFS, maybe it's just the terminology that's confusing me. If you say FSID, that doesn't really uh, reflect the subvolume concept, right? Subvolume is not a file system, not a file system ID. So right. I think it should be just some generic UUID that file systems can fill in or not fill in and then Not provide the FSID information. Yeah, 
Well, so all, yeah. all file systems have a UUID. So when I say FSID, what I mean is the FS-wide UUID. Yeah. So we have UUIDs, X4 has UUIDs, and as far as I know, XFS has UUIDs. Like, the, when I say FSID, I mean the FS UUID. And then ButterFS takes it the next step further, and that every subvolume has its own oh, UUID okay. as well. So, like, you can, like... It, it, it still had, there is a, it has an inherent double meaning, so to speak, because some file systems don't really use it as a file system UUID. They extend it to a different concept, which in this case is a subvolume. Right. right. Okay. So, like, I mean, I can easily just say, you know, U64, right? Like, I could, like, I think that having the UUID exportable, or, you know, we can just get it from block ID. It's, don't need to actually export that. Like, having the UUID for F, the file system, it, we can already get that through other means. So we don't necessarily have to have that. It's the subvolume. It's, it makes it easier to, for user space to map back to what they're on. Um, but the real issue is, like, having a way to articulate that you're on a separate inode space. One option that you have, either with StatX or maybe StatFS. So StatFS already re returns uh, a, a field called FSID, right? Sometimes it's a digest of the UUID. Of the oh, yeah. It has. Yeah. Other file systems, maybe like TempFS or... It's just a, a STDF usually, but there's there's an identific uh, identifier. Uh, maybe you could go the route of instead of adding things to StatX, uh, use the at flags to say at root or whatever, and then then just get the FSID of the root. Okay, kind of. that's an option. One more thing, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, a couple of years back. I, I added the uh, file system uh, watch to FS Notify. The ability to watch events on the, the old super block. So ButterFS is supported, but not a sub volume. Because of the fact that SB, the, that the FSID of the object inside the snapshot is different from the root, I accepted it. So just to you know, that's one more issue that is out there. People okay. cannot watch uh, uh, sub-volume. Okay. That's good to know. I didn't know that. This gets better and better. Leighton says there's no add or sub-volume constant in NFC4. You'll need to run it through IETF anyway. Yeah, Leighton, isn't there, I thought there was some way for you to articulate, like, this is on a different file system. Like, because Neil was saying that he was going to have to do something awkward for NFS2, but NFS3 or 4 were going to be fine as long as he had this other unique identifier to say, like, okay, this identifier plus inode number. Um, okay. And, like, I, I don't know how you guys would do it, but, like, I know Neil was trying to, like, mess with the inode numbers, but if we could just give you a unique identifier that says, okay, this is the root or whatever. I didn't understand why he couldn't just use our file handle because we encode this in the file handle already. But, I mean, I have the information to give you. <laughs> just <laughs> how do you want me to give it to you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it seems like even if you have one solution for NFS, uh, and a different solution for locally mounted files uh, where you modulate, you know, the uh, block, block ID so that, you know, rsync does the right thing for a, a local file system, you know, ButterFS access through the local file system, uh, you're still going to have the issue for rsync, because rsync is only going to know about, uh, well, rsync or other POSIX you know, only programs that are only using stdev and the inode yeah. um, for a file system that started out as ButterFS with multiple sub-volumes, exported via NFS, and then rsync works on the NFS client. So it seems like we still need to somehow do a best effort attempt to uniquify the inode numbers that are seen by the NFS client, right? I mean, even if it's just use a hash function that 64 bits will be mostly unique or something, 
right? Because I, I think it's great to talk about things that work for programs that know how to use statics. Yeah. But it seems like there still needs to be some sort of best effort for naive programs or our sync on RHEL 7 that is not using, you know, the fancy latest interface. Yeah, so like the ST dev thing is never going away <laughs> specifically for that case, yeah. right? So what I'm talking about is the feature is, you know, we inside Facebook want to more easily say this this file belongs to this disk so we can do X things, right? A clean way to do that is to export the FSID. Um, I don't know what NFS has as far as options of uniqueifying, but I know that Neil was like doing the XOR and all this stuff and he was just getting crucified for it. But there appeared to exist a way to give the client enough information to do it as long as we had yet another unique identifier. And I've got the unique identifier, it's just, what, which one do you want and how do you want it? Yeah, I, I think part of it is, you know, for those of us who have to deal with enterprise customers who, you know, you're gonna have to pry RHEL 7 out of their cold dead hands. Yeah, which know? like the dev T thing is a very elegant solution for this, right? Like it just solves it, at least on the local stuff. It doesn't solve it for NFS, but right. also RHEL 7 doesn't support ButterFS, so I don't have to think about them. <laughs> but RHEL 7 could support ButterFS as accessed over NFS. Uh, access right? over NFS, yeah, that's yeah. true. No, I like, to be clear, my, my response to this historically has been uh, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Don't export the local cell volume and the snapshot over the same volume. Right. Problem solved. However, uh, that wasn't well received. Could you maybe, do we have the time? Probably have. Could you maybe summarize the solutions that have been proposed and knacked so far? So Neil tried a variety of different ways to send the root object ID across to do some hashing, so like XOR and stuff. One, he just like made up a random number to XOR with the, with the, um, he like XORed the dev T with the inode number, all this stuff Christoph got really upset about. Um, one thing that Christoph always comes out with is like you need to make these sub like VFS mounts, which doesn't make any sense, like if you still have the same problem. So I, he always says this and it makes zero sense. The, um, Is he trying to say uniqueify by mount ID? No. Yeah, so I guess that's kind of what he's wanting uh. is like he wants us to have a, a VFS mount for every sub volume. That is a non-starter because a VFS mount has to have a unique sub volume, uh, a unique super block. The, now, that clearly can be changed. We are programmers here. We can relax that sort of thing. However, you're talking about like an order of magnitude more VFS mounts. We have thousands of sub volumes and you're talking about have to like mount all of these things up anytime you walk into them and walk out of them. That's, no. You need you need threads per file system, right? But so every mount would generate their own threads, so which will be another nightmare to take care of. Yeah. Like, so yeah, but there was another solution proposed, I believe, uh, around two years back. I believe Mark Fasche was working on it, uh, on views, but I don't know how far it went though. Oh, I remember. So that. it was basically he, he, it has the same concept of uh, having super uh, not super blocks, but a lightweight super block called view which would basically be added to each sub-volume mount right. and would supply the dev or something. Yeah, I like that would be reasonable too. Like, I don't, this, I'm just tired of talking about this. Like, I think that my, my solution is we extend SATFS and SATX to give us more information and then we let, the, let everybody else deal with that. I think that's the cleanest solution because everything else is hacky. This, the, the dev T thing is gonna stay forever because people will, are still running RHEL 4. But the, as far as like how we move forward, I think that we, exporting the UID for the file system is really helpful and exporting the um, subvolume UID per file for us is also helpful. The information that we, you said that you wanted to export to StatX, it's already available to NFST. 
to kernel NFSD. So the it, UUID it, is available and the root is available? It, it's not yet. So like it's what NFSD uses case that X, which it's not in there. So like it has no way of knowing that. So this is why I'm talking about extending it. What do you mean? So NFSD currently uses case that X, right? Or whatever to get this. Yeah, but it has a den tree. Oh, that's, yeah, but like the den tree, like the den tree trees are all together. It just, you get us, you get like the same, I don't know. Yeah, you can't tell. Yep. It calls get adder for the FS. That's what Leighton said. So like if we, like we need to stuff it somewhere so that somebody knows something. I can put the, I can give you the, U, if we don't like the UUID, I can give you the, the U64 object ID of the root. That's unique. Yeah. Right. I, like, well, that's the thing is like other people, like user space has use for this information. I mean, if enough people ask for it once it's in case that. Yeah, that's true. All I right. I think the, the, just a final point, I think the main, it sounds like the main issue here will be to summarize the solutions that have already been proposed and why they were uh, rejected to build a solid base for why this solution should be accepted. Right, so the solutions that were suggested is uh, Christoph's VFS mount thing. I mean, just when you send a new Oh, when I send a new thing, basically. yeah, okay, sounds good. Oh, Ted's got one last thing. Yeah, I, it seems like there's an LWN article from, I think it's August 2021, uh, the title is ButterFS Inode Number Epic, yeah. uh, which I think actually already summarized all of these different solutions. So it may be sufficient just to reference the LWN article. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that you guys wrote that. So like, I, like, I think that, yeah, I'll link the article, but you know, it's talk, we're talking about exposing shit to the to user space and that's, you know, we'll be here a while. Cool, so we're running over time and we've got a joint session with IOTREK. Oh, sorry, yeah. Steve, why don't you? So, you know, from my perspective, this is useful because it could affect, you know, kernel server maybe, and, you know, it's a useful topic. But what, what jumps out at me is stat, x stat, stat x. This isn't the only thing that's like a 10 out of 10 obvious that ought to be added. I think that your idea of adding is good, but there's got to be some synergy for a few other things. There are, I think, six flags that I could add that NTFS also supports that seem to make just as much sense and just as important. You know, is a file offline, right? I mean, your app needs to. Yeah, I don't know, but what I'm getting at is that I think this is a 10 out of 10 important topic, so maybe we can talk about it tomorrow or the day after. Because there are other flags that have a lot of value and, you know, for BTRFS integrity checking. Okay. So, uh, and well, maybe we can talk about it more, but I think that it would be a good thing to talk about whether there's at least two file systems that need this, or there's at least two file systems that need integrity checking or offline, or because statics is easy, right? We can just add flags. Yeah. All right. Yes. Let's, uh, yeah, I see you, Omar. We're coming. All right, guys, we're moving over to the IO track. Uh, people in the virtual on the Zoom call, if you want to watch this next one, uh, go click on the Zoom link for the IO track. That's where we will be. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>